Uh, thank you, everyone, for being patient. Uh, has anyone been to Apache Kucha? They're in 260 cities worldwide. We got one in the back. Uh, two, three, four. Well, Pecha Kucha requires some audience participation, and um, I'm going to ask you to pet your kucha. <laughs> and if you don't know where that is, then look to your neighbor and find the, where they're petting their kucha. But actually, Pecha Kucha is from Tokyo, and it's pronounced pachacha, and it means chit-chat, or the actual sound of uh, talking. And um, it was started in 2003 by uh, an architecture firm to uh, save a bar from actually closing and getting in creative types from architects to um, designers to artists uh, to exp explore and express their creative ideas and their value added to their, their various fields. Um, this is uh, the third year that uh, Miami is been doing Pecha Kuchas and uh, the first, the second year that our Basel has hosted a Pecha Kucha. The first one was back in 2006 and we're happy to be back. Um, we've got six people exploring social media and contemporary art. This is, as you probably can all imagine, is a very new field and we've got artists looking at uh, social media. We actually have people who are doing social media. We have trend makers who uh, are setting the social media kind of genre. And um, we're going to wrap up with uh, a group who have successfully gone from the television audience to uh, online and uh, are selling their artwork, um, not only through television, but then also through the internet as well. Um, without further ado, we're going to have Ben Davis uh, if we could queue up the presentation, that would be great. And Ben is from Artnet. There's a f few logistics here. I just want to make sure that everyone is familiar with them. We're going to start with the, it's 20 seconds a slide. So there's no stopping. There's no question and answer. It's six speakers that will give you any and any informa information that you're interested in in social media. Um, so um, seven presentations back to back for maximum interest and it's six minutes or 40 seconds or 20 seconds a slide and you'll hold your questions to the end. Um, please come up to me afterwards if you have any interest in next year or there's a field that you'd like to explore for Pecha Kucha next year. Uh, the website is pechacucha.org and it is a trademarked um, presentation style. Great. And the next person should be Ben. Great, thank you very much. Oh. Okay. okay. Ash, there's been a little bit of mix up. Sorry, Dylan is gonna go first. So <laughs> I'm going to jump right in. My name is Dylan Fareed. I uh, was formerly a graph designer, sort of doing a jobbing design in New York City for many years, working in uh, the art industry, mainly working, building uh, back ends for art galleries and artists. I, uh, you know, over the course of that time, I realized that I was, you know, on a, almost every single project being asked to do the same thing over and over again. And I realized uh, that there were a couple problems here. One was that, you know, that sort of process didn't really make sense, and it, it also meant that, you know, all the data out there being produced by galleries, by museums, uh, they were all, you know, the sort of data was very fragmented. And with Artlog and Arlo, sort of two of my companies, my projects that I run now, um, we're trying to address those issues, those issues of data fragmentation, and uh, uh, and to, to to also to a great degree, sort of real time. Um, media that's that's sort of happening now. Uh, Artlog is a directory site that's, that for two years we've run um, out of New York City. I recently moved to San Francisco to continue to run Artlog and I have a partner in New York City who runs it out of New York. Um, our, our main focuses are um, you know sort of to aggregate data throughout uh, the art and culture world and also to um, broadcast it in, in real time and, uh, and also to sort of like continue with this idea of real time conversations. 
um, we don't per se, uh, or we, we actually don't focus on our own personal curatorial vision. We, we do have one, but we, we like to think that uh, what should set, set, set us apart from the other you know, competing art directories is uh, not necessarily sort of the uh, completeness of our databases, but uh, to, to, to a great degree, um, uh, you know, that, that curatorial vision, and, and <laughs> this is a little bit faster than I'm used to, but um, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at, I guess, is just that uh, our plan is to aggregate this data and rebroadcast it, uh, both to the audience of art goers and, uh, you know, art galleries and artists, but also to our other, you know, our competitors, essentially. So, you know, we are, we're creating this sort of uh, neutral system through which we can broadcast, um, you know, the data about events, about upcoming shows, about uh, shows in the in, in well in the past at museums, at galleries. Um, this is a slide really more about uh, offline social networking and about uh, how our experiences of these shows are now being mediated by both digital devices in the real world and still being focused, you know, in these interpersonal relationships. So a lot of what ArtLog has done in New York City is host. Um, in-person events in addition to our web offerings. Um, those in-person events, um, you know, were focused on in neighborhoods like Dumbo, like Lower East Side and Soho. And, uh, and what we did was we sought to, you know, bring many, many people together to a uh, collective art opening of 20 galleries, 20 institutions, institutions like the New Museum and the, D and, uh, and the D in Soho and, and Brooklyn Arts Council in Dumbo. <laughs> And then what we've done this week is we've taken advantage of services like Twitter, um, SMS short codes that we've set up, and are, we have created what we call Art Lot Live, which is a distributed system of sort of conversing with people at all of these different fairs, um, just to sort of look at <laughs> quickly sort of what's been said recently, um, just just sort of today, you know, there was a person at the Inc. Art Fair who was. Uh, <laughs> calling out as, as, as being very attractive, a, a guy working uh, at, at the front desk with a mohawk. There was uh, Andrew and Andrew here who, at Art Basel, who spotted Val Kilmer. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's also, uh, uh, in any case, this is, uh, these are slides of Arlo, which is um, our content management systems, which we built for galleries and artists that focus on a clear interface and uh, ease of use. The front ends uh, are entirely flexible. We have certain conventions for the existing themes, but um, that flexibility, uh, I mean, but there's enormous flexibility in terms of what you can actually do to get at the code very simply. Um, the output of these sites also, they're very data rich so that you can actually push data from Arlo to our art log to Twitter to Facebook, uh, sort of all throughout the web. So we're using Arlo as a way to both, you know, scratch our own itch in terms of getting data easily, but also to make the lives of galleries and artists easier in terms of getting their data broadcast into sort of usable formats from us, uh, you know, and other consumers. Um, the, <laughs> I know the Shepherd Ferry spoke this afternoon, and the giants that I'm referring to here are not necessarily uh, Andre the Giant, but, um, but sort of the giants in, in technology that are allowing uh, companies that are small, like, my, like, like our company, to, to really do a whole lot. So, you know, we, we're just, just two, two people in New York and San Francisco, but we're able to leverage these services to, uh, these open source services to, you know, call from feeds and other web services to share code on sites like GitHub and, uh, and to corral audiences through Twitter. Um, and, and that really sort of makes it all possible for us. Um, I'm Still Live is a printmaking venture that I run out of San Francisco where I work with local artists and run editions of their work. This is Dan Funderburg on, sta on, on, the, on the screen. And uh, on the I'm Still Live website, we also catalog the production process of producing the prints and actually all data related to that, to that production going down to um, you know, the purchase of paper and, uh, and, the, and the sort of where, where, where prints are being shipped. Uh, Jetty is a program, uh, pr an application I'm not really going to discuss because we're launching next next year and it's a, it's a new messaging application. But largely, what Artlog and Arlo do is we uh, are focused in real time art and culture media and about sort of leveraging open source technologies. So I'm going to take a quick photo and post it to Artlog. Thanks, guys, for bearing with me, and wave. <laughs>
Awesome. Thanks. Okay, and now for something completely different. Um, should I wait? Just to say, don't be alarmed if I, I've never done a Pecha Kucha, so I uh, didn't realize how brief they were, so don't be alarmed if the slides go out of sync with what I'm saying. So um, I'm an art critic, so in order to make this question useful, uh, interesting to me, I really had to think about it in terms of uh, critical opposition. So I'm just gonna use the Wikipedia um, idea of social media, which is you know the opposition between old closed media and new uh, social media based on uh, relationships. And I think it's useful to frame it this way because we're trying to compare two things, right? Social media and arts. So we want to think about common oppositions, common problems that they're both logics that they're both working on. I wrote an article earlier this um, earlier this year called the Twitter Aesthetic, which basically argued uh, that. Um, the uh, art, the Twitter was the form of writing that best captured the experience of being in an art fair. Why? Because um, art fair is not a neutral social space. It flatters certain kinds of aesthetic experiences, things that are immediately spe immediate, um, spectacular, and which happen to be the same kind of, of information that Twitter circulates well. So here's a slide that just images uh, illustrates sort of how the typical shot of what an art fair looks like actually kind of looks like the Twitter screen, you know, the fragmented space of lots of disconnected information flying at you. So all of this is just to say that uh, um, to think of, I think it's useful, more use, useful to think about media as a tool that's in relationship with certain pro flourishes because it's in relationship with certain uh, uh, problems society is, is interested in. Um, and... Uh, in this opposition between going from monologue culture to a dialogue culture is actually something the art world has thought about and has a lot to say. For example, there's the very uh, old question of, uh, or problem of postmodernism, which is about the transition from a single fixed narrative to a pluralistic, multiple, multi-layered relational space. Um, more recently, uh, slides are gonna move out of sync now. Um, you know, artists have been working on the idea of relational aesthetics, like was mentioned, which is precisely the idea of valuing an object not as a closed system, but in terms of the relationships that are around it. So for me, to kind of think about this, make this interesting, what I did, and it'll come up in a second, is I constructed what's called a Gramassian semiotic square, um, which is a theoretical tool that just allows you to take an opposition, like the opposition between um, art and uh, old media and social media and tease out the nuances of the opposition as in if you think about any basic relationship um, there are actually sub or other terms that are implied so art and social media for instance if you think about it there's an opposition between old media and uh, social media but there's also an opposition between old media and other kinds of online content that are not necessarily social media do a lot of the same things that old media can do but are more accessible, so therefore um, threatens to cancel it out. That's what I call the term anti-old media. And then there are certain kinds of um, media that are, uh, have a certain kind of social dimension, but not really social media. They offer you choice, but it's sort of pseudo-social media. That's what I'd call um, uh, anti-social media. Here's my semiotic rectangle, this exciting esoteric device. So the... Um, the uh, interesting thing for me is, is you take these things and then you can think about, you have these different kinds of um, terms and you can think about, the art historians, theorists have used it, you think about the kind of different relationships between the possible different relationships between the different terms. So you could think about different kinds of artistic possibilities, for instance, that you would come up with. So coming up here in a second. Um, if you take, um, for instance, here's my square representing my different terms, um, it's fairly easy to come up, think about um, things that combine the top axis, the old media and social media. And I think the most obvious one is just the comments page of an online newspaper, where you just take an old kind of media and you just add on a social media component. Um, and there's an artistic equivalent to that that I think is fairly obvious, which is just you know, artists who use a social media platform to do the same kind of um, the same kind of uh, 
performances they might do in real space, you know? Um, and I have a just example right here um, coming up, uh, which is, you know, it's I'm not gonna talk about it too much because it's not time. I think the more interesting thing, more illuminating thing, is then to think about the, uh, the left-hand axis, the relationship between um, old media and what I've called anti-social media, which sounds kind of abstract, but um, it's not that hard to think of something like Google Ads, you know? It offers the semblance of kind of content that's tailored to you, but actually, in the end, it's basically just an, uh, a an, uh, just an ad. It's just an ad targeted at you. And there's an artistic, strange as it may be to say, I think the artistic equivalent of that way of thinking would be the paradigm of interactive art, um, which, you know, does give you a semblance of kind of a tailorized, tailored experience, experience tailored to you. But it's basically just using the, the viewer's um, social presence as sort of raw material to produce a predictable kind of experience that the artist predicts. <coughs> If you move over to what would be my um, right-hand axis of my thing, the relationship between social media and anti-old um, uh, media or pseudo-old media, I think the best example is like Wikipedia, right? Collaborative art projects. It's, it is an encyclopedia. It actually threatens to replace old, uh, old media encyclopedias, but it actually has an interactive content that completely changes the way, um, it completely changes everything. And it's not too hard to think of artistic equivalents of that, you know, the, the uh, online collaborative kind of thing is just an online collaborative quilt. Finally, I think the most, the most interesting thing that my uh, theoretical device allows us to do is really on the bottom axis, the relationship between pseudo-old media or anti-old media and anti-social um, anti media. And I think that the, 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 the paradigm there is virtual art, right? You know, art that's created um, in a virtual sphere, like this is an artist who works in Second Life, basically art like you'd produce in the real world, but it's produced using this pastiche language. So all I'm saying, ooh, and here's my, the, next, the next person coming up. I hope that gives us something to talk about. It certainly gave me more to talk about than uh, I have time to do. So. This, uh, the collaborative art nature that uh, Ben just referred to is a bit about what we're going to talk, what I'm going to speak about today. But um, overall, it's really about taking things in the physical world, whether it's your life or whether it is something that you create, and, and making it social, engaging a broader group of people that might otherwise be able to enjoy and experience it. Something like Art, art Basel. Um, we're limited by time and space. And what we try to do at MoBlog is, is enable things to transcend physical space. What I'm gonna talk about is sort of four areas. MoBlog is a mobile blogging community. And when I describe well, the mobile blogging community where people and groups can share their lives, share their art, uh, or in, and you can post from anywhere to create a mobile and website populated by the content in your mobile phone. So audio, video, and, and text. And then interact with other people in and around that content. What I, if there's one thing that you leave with, I'd love for you to know that MoBlog doesn't necessarily mean that it's mobile. It's, again, bridging physical space. You're, you take a photo with your camera, the image is saved, and then the content is sent in a variety of mechanisms or upload to a web and mobile site that then is a reflection of your life or an idea. In this case, this is a reflection of my life. Um, I just created um, an image wall with some photos that reflect my travels, um, art galleries in Beijing, um, time in New Orleans with, with my, my daughter, and time, obviously, at the beach. It can also be used by organizations to create a visual history and visual present because of the instantaneity. So I, I love when an organization can actually show how it's been, what, what it's been doing for the year. And Greenpeace uses this very effectively in the United Kingdom, which is where we're based. The reach of a typical website with a lot of SEO effort and online marketing 
You may be able to fill a stadium. We all know that even though this isn't a baseball field, when we build it, they do not necessarily come. Um, so it does take work, but, but you can reach a lot more people when you put something up on the web. When you join into a social network of people, then you have the opportunity to broaden that audience even further. So in 2006, a Channel 4 media in the United Kingdom came to us with an idea of creating a map of public art in the United Kingdom. It's a way to not only capture what exists, but to also inspire people who might not otherwise be creating to transform their environments. And what I've tried to do is select some of the images representative from Big Art Mobe. So if you look at the map, these are postings. There's lots of images behind it. Um, and we have the ability to map according to a Glastonbury concert environment in order to foster well-being for the area to, to, to mapping um, in the UK. And you'll notice that the maps can get closer and closer in. So if I click on a particular um, arrow, what will come up is collaborative metadata. I can find out where it's located. I can find out who did it. I can get comments. And I can go back to the person who actually posted it and look at the other things that they've chosen to share as they're walking through their lives in the United Kingdom. So this is a particularly exciting group called Skeleton Clue, Crew from Worthing. They take youth, youth groups and really seek to engage and inspire them to create art. So what you can see is they're working in an underpass that had nothing, and then look at what it was transformed into. And as I came into the parking lot across the street, I was thinking, imagine if the parking lot across the street had some aspects of what was done by these uh, young people in Worthing. And the next image will show you a parking lot to which they were assigned the theme, Lost Civilizations. And this is one of the pictures. And then when they pulled back and showed the, uh, the next slide, I, I was absolutely astounded and, um, and really inspired me to think about what it would be like to walk into a parking lot that, that greeted me in this particular way, how, how my day might, might be different. Um, the, the opportunity is also there to create groups. So some individuals are very interested in lions and create, oh, this, is just, this is just to say that even though Big Art Mobe was designed to create a, a, a map of the art in the United Kingdom, a number of countries, have, a number of people from other countries have gotten involved and obviously this is one from Greece. Someone in the UK started this lions group and what you'll see in the next two slides is a posting from Lyon, France, and um, from Tel Aviv, Israel. So just lions in, you know, in, from the old days or from modern graffiti um, being reflected. And there are numbers of themes. The, um, the Henry Thoreau exhibit at Kew Gardens, a group was created, and anyone who went to visit was able to post uh, images. And they highlight, the Big Art Mobe editors highlight, which is actually a a great experience to get an email saying that your post has been highlighted on Big Art Mobe. And I think um, I'll let these, these highlights speak for themselves, but what I find so amazing is if I can't go to Salisbury or if I can't go to some of the other places, I do have an opportunity to, to look at art that's all over the country, even though I'm just sitting in, in at my, in my home and to share those with, with people that I like and to comment and to have them write back and talk about why they chose to, to take these particular, these particular images. What happens on MoBlog around highlights is not only is the art piece or the person's life potentially a, um, I could just let, let these run through, I guess. I actually posted from a park from, uh, from where I, I live in London, and within about two minutes, I got an SMS text 
by someone asking me where I was because they were just a few, a few uh, steps away on the other side of the park. So it can be a little bit scary, but it does connect, connect everyone. And the other thing that's happened around Big Art Mobe is it's created a great deal of debate on what is public art, which is what the founder of this particular um, project was seeking to do. Um, when it received the Royal Television Society Innovation Award and Media and Guardian Award, I just thought what one of the judges said was particularly moving. Big Art Mobe was awarded um, this prize. It's a creative project that encourages almost anyone to get involved, a large-scale example of television production in your pocket. Anyone can become a contributor or commentator as long as they've got a mobile phone. I selected this image because I just wanted to show you can, people end up having big discussions on Moblog and that not only might the art be what's shot, but also the photograph itself can be, uh, can be amazingly artistic, um, which, is, which is what I, I thought about this next photo as well. This next slide um, is by the architects of AIR who build and exhibit the luminaria designed by Alan Parkinson. And uh, basically they treat the inflated object as an immersive art experience in which light, sound, and architectural form combine. It's supposed to, um, the, the, the person who wrote this basically said, I want to live, you know, I never want to leave and I want to live here forever. We also do a lot of competitions on, on Moblog whether it's Valentine's Day or during a particularly dreary time of year, capturing the best smile. And it really can, can uh, engage people. This is a geographic um, Love Leads photo competition, and we've had competitions across five countries for the photo that best represents the, um, the place in which you live. More recently, we've gotten involved in something that Ben alluded to, which is creating art, collaborative art, through GPS postings. This is... a, a very exciting project um, the a TED Prize photographer wanted to highlight to, uh, a very extremely resistant form of tuberculosis. So we created the logo through a treasure hunt to find items and then post from those coordinates. And it engaged people in a game and a treasure hunt and an adventure around a particularly important question um, in, in a different way. That led us to create the largest geo, geo, geoglyph in the world, which we're calling a digiglyph. Um, so from across the UK, people went to different coordinates and posted um, from, from where they were uh, to create a chronometer. And essentially, what I love about Moblog is, is that it enables people to share from anywhere to people who are who are interested in the topic. And it turns art into a conversation rather than I'm looking at this today and you're looking at it next. And I found myself saying, as I've been walking through, so inspired and moved by what's here, how wonderful to, to see the what, but how nice to know the how and why. And I suppose that's why all of you are here. And if the artists were moblogging what they were doing as they were creating it, all of us would, would have that much more insight into how and why they chose to do the beautiful things that they do. So thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Leighton Rodriguez Casanova. Um, and my, slide, my images will probably be completely out of sync as well, but bear with me. Um, I'm a practicing artist, uh, and I also am the owner of Fulano Inc., which is a design studio here in Miami. Uh, this is one of the first experiments that we did a while ago in incorporating Web 2.0 and social medias to uh, basically populate the web with um, our work. And this is basically my site. Um, and uh, the site has all of the upcoming exhibitions that I'm doing, uh, any news articles that come up that are completely linked on the site, um, all of my images and so on and so forth. But at the same time, I populated uh, Flickr and a lot of the other uh, uh, social media sites like, and, I'm, and I also use Twitter and Facebook to communicate the same messages and uh, kind of get it out there. So if a curator um, in Germany 
is doing research like I often do where I go on Google and I you know, type in an artist's name to find out more information about that artist. Um, it uh, basically allows me to not only have images on my site that are being searchable, searched and, and that are searchable for somebody to see, but also on Flickr and many other venues, people can get a sense for what it is that I'm doing. Um, and this is uh, the, uh, the, the site that uh, back then I developed, which was the first experiment that we had done back in that time. Our design studio was mainly using Flash, which is a, a, a very contained form of developing for the web. Um, and it's great. It has a lot of animation. You can do wonderful things with it. But it was very self-contained. And so we wanted to try to uh, expand ourselves. So to develop the site, I used a very popular blogging engine, uh, WordPress. And we basically went in and, and used WordPress. It's open source. It's free for anybody to use. And we made it look and do uh, exactly what we wanted it to do. Uh, here's where the slides completely go out of sync. Uh, this is basically my work, and it's mostly sculptural. Um, it's com a complete contrast to what the design studio does. Um, but, but it's a really great angle to be able to, uh, both my partner and I are sculptors, uh, but we also minored in typography and design, and so we're able to kind of bring the sensibilities from majoring in, in, in fine art into design as we develop projects, whether it's print or web development projects, for a lot of the clients that we work with. Um, and as the slides progress, um, we'll eventually get to what I want to uh, focus on, which is uh, not only with that first experiment did we solve problems for, for my site and my partner's site as far as like populating the internet with images and information about our work, but then we started to uh, help a lot of the art institutions to do the same thing. So, um, for example, the, the, the client that I, I'm going to focus on that we worked with uh, was the Museum of Contemporary Art North Miami. And the site that they were working with was a site that was developed in HTML, but it was developed in, 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 in a way that was a very uh, early way of developing HTML where, you know, you, you've got the developer that developed these static pages, and the pages have to be changed by the person who developed the pages. And so the museum was having problems updating the information and getting all of the events that they were doing out to the public. So the problem that we were solving is, well, how can we develop something where the entire museum staff can update all of the information um, and get the museum on a Web 2.0 uh, uh, sort of ideology and using all of the different social medias to get their information out there in a very inexpensive way. And so what we uh, basically did, and this is, the, this is the site that I'm talking about right now, uh, we redeveloped the site using an open source uh, CMS, um, uh, which helps the museum manage all of their content. So the entire staff can update all of the news events. They have a blog they can post to. Um, and they can uh, upload photos and change everything on the fly. And different departments can change different aspects of the site uh, as the programs are changing. One of the great things that we did was uh, we incorporated a lot of the images that the museum was uploading into Flickr and then displayed those images on their site so that the uh, museum staff can upload as many photos as they want to Flickr. And not only are their photos being displayed on the, the site, but they're also populating the internet with images on Flickr as well, which is a, you know, a, a, a visual social uh, uh, media entity. Um, and, uh, and basically, the, the most important component that we really wanted to concentrate was affordability. And how can we develop something that was, uh, that was giving the museum the complete freedom that they needed to update all of their information online and keep all of the photos online and update videos and everything while keeping the development uh, inexpensive. And we found that incorporating all of these social medias allowed us to use these systems that are in place already, that do an amazing job, that are free, um, and incorporate them and code them back into the website that we were developing for the museum. And that's my view. Hello. <clears throat> my name is Dean Asabi. You're probably wondering what that means. It's an unpronounceable technology symbol that's meant to be typed. And my slides are in chronological order, so we're going to flow through them. 
I come from a different angle about this. At the same time that these social networks uh, were emerging on the scene, so were the physical hardwares of communication technologies. These are site-specific photographs that were created in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And I make temporary sets in the studio that speak of possible aesthetics of wireless data. Um, as you can see here, it appears that it would be created in three-dimensional programs or something like that, but it's not. These are all handmade uh, sculptural components with fireworks encapsulated in time shot in complete darkness. And um, as this work evolved, I wanted to lose the technology hardware because we're all used to that being in our neighborhoods. It's uh, on every new corner. It's everywhere that we're around. So I started to think about new abstract ideas without the technology, uh, communication devices in place where how do we understand a blossoming of ideas or how do we distribute this wireless data in communication? Does it roll along buildings like waves? Does it reflect and bounce and is it organic? Is it sexual? Does it replicate? How do these things happen? It's not this straight line between you and your phone. It, it's on organic waves, carrier waves. So I started thinking about these things in organic um, ideas and natures and ecosystems. They're living objects that create this data and bring this data to us. So it creates this really interesting idea of what does it look like when you receive a text message? What does it look like when you uh, receive a call or there's a cluster of calls in one neighborhood? Is this something that could be sculptural and exciting and organic? So as this happened, simultaneously I'm working um, continuously with technologies as they evolve. So for me, it's very difficult to even, in the future, predict what I'll be working on. This is about the hardware technologies. So these are decased iPod sculptures. And iPods revolutionized the way we organize and distribute music. So I decided that I would take these iPods apart and take them from being an individual content device into a freestanding video sculpture where we could all interface with them together and have dialogue about this. Um, as you see, the arrows signify velocity, direction, and evolutionary change. Um, if you notice on these, these are fiber optic networks. And all of our communication data now is living on these fiber optic networks. So why not use this as a raw material for the creation of art? Let's use these systems as aesthetic systems and try to talk about these complex mini systems. So here's an example of taking 11 iPods networking these together and creating an ecosphere, like a coral reef of biodiversity, where this becomes something where they function together, instead of all of us in our, you know, looking at them in our own eyes and not sharing this information. So as I'm working with these unseen forces of wireless data and these abstract ideas of technology, also religion is this unseen phenomenon. Is there a way that we can, in the future, understand religious ideas in a different and unique way. Um, if we were to build a new cathedral or a new chapel, doesn't it seem fitting that we would integrate new technologies? Um, for instance, if you're in an old cathedral in Spain and you look around at the old work, and, but then you realize it's electrified, the sound's amplified. So where do you draw the line between what happens in the future with trying to create an awe-inspiring experience of something that's unseen but only felt? So this really relates to the wireless data type thing, but it keeps evolving over time. So as this is happening the same time with the iPods, I'm starting to become interested in this space between me and the screen. What happens here? This is also carrier waves and organic waves carrying this information in this unseen space. So what happens here on these LCD screens is trying to utilize this underutilized sculptural territory. You know, it's somewhere that this is a space that sculptures aren't created. So what happens here on these pieces is that I photograph uh, in complete darkness the sculptural components and try to relate them with a two-dimensional image. So it's a collaborative experience between 3D, 2D, and these plasma screens we all have in our houses. It's very important that these become raw materials for artists to use. These are not for us to consume content and consume entertainment and consume data, but these are you know, tools for artists to use as raw materials, same with the iPods as well. Working over time with these technologies and embedding LEDs and fiber optic systems, that I realized that that's the nature of life. And the nature of life is emitting light and sound and data. So these are based on genetic images. They're photographs, again. Temporary sets, lots of times room size. 
and they're hand lit with LEDs, maybe three minutes time of long exposures, smoke and fog and projections and water, and this energy becomes encapsulated in time so that we can visualize this new form of, of beta. As you know now, there's so many new forms of um, visualizing the unseen, whether it be genetics or astrophysics or things like that. So I started to try to take these raw materials into genetic organic shapes and think about them as uh, um, models and maquettes for the future of genetics. As this all moves, you know, continuously, I started to think about how nature becomes involved. So these are the newest photographs that I've been working on. This was actually shot in the shoreline in the surf in complete darkness in the middle of the night. And it's interesting to build a fiber optic sculptural system that integrated with the organic nature of the waves and encapsulated time. You can see where there's many explosions and light. Some things have been in motion and moved and others have been you know, still by the, the flash of the photography. So what happens for me is this exciting paradigm where um, how organic is this data? Is this data something sterile and uninteresting? Although when you get it on your phone, it's from your mom or it's from your friend, it becomes this engaging data. But where is it in between? So that's really what I'm trying to work on is this interesting idea of the organic nature of the blossom. <laughs> Pretty quick, I apologize for that. Okay, let's go. So I am a trend spotter. I was a graphic designer for years. I went to art school way back in the 70s, an alternative art school. And so now I've created my business and I call my business Culture of Future and I consider it an art project. I work with a lot of the big brands. Um, we are trying to now in America figure out what we do with this overconsumption patterning we've created. So now I'm one of the people going into the big brands and working with them and shifting what that, you know, what that is. Um, we're bringing a con consumption humanism in, um, a citizenry respect, and so that's my job as a trend futurist. Um, I speak a lot around the world, Istanbul um, this year, um, Finland recently, um, Mumbai, and I bring in the ideas of new consumption. We've shifted from the old industrial model to the new model of co-sharing. We're in between, and what does that look like? What are the words? What are the examples? And how are we working? Social media is that. It encapsulates that. And so right now, the biggest trend is the influence of citizen passion collectives. So we have dynamic people that have energy, and they have an idea, and they collect people around them online, and now real life is mimicking that. And so we're calling this people like Amy Franceschini in San Francisco, who created Future Farmers. And she's collected all of these people, and art now is a social innovation. It's a practice that creates change. Social issues, materials explored, solutions amplified by social media. So not only are we in real life mimicking online, we are now actually creating change through art that of course always pierces the soul. Art pierces the soul. And now we're doing art that directly links to social innovation because of social media. So here's an example. Artists in participatory roles creating Far, creating farms in the city, and now Victory Gardens have been reinvented. And um, here she has created something called Open Engagement, which is now a conference in Portland coming up, so check it out online. And Amy is inviting people to come for free and do art together in a social innovative setting. Art as socially innovative service, and we know art has always been about changing and creating change, but now we directly link it to social issues. It's an incredible time of change in our world, time to get up, speak, say your statement, be your own charismatic passion driver, collect people around you, contribute, and in your own way do art. And Robert Redford is the primary example, so this is non-generational. Robert Redford has created Sundance, which is really an art statement of the co-sharing of how are we going to do this differently going forward. So Robert Redford has um, done the forward to the Clean Common Energy Sense book. He has now the Redford Center, which is across the hall from where I work at the David Brower Center. It's a collection of 100 dot orgs in this beautiful platinum lead building in Berkeley. Um, so you know, go ahead and look at things online. Right now, Sundance has just created this Sundance across the um, nation. 
So while Sundance 2010 is going to have the films go into different cities concurrently while they're also showing at Sundance. So um, Robert Redford is trying to draw the US into these documentary style, social innovative ideas. And he is one of the um, top passion drivers, along with people across the country like Amy, who create art that then is mimicked in real life and creates change. Victory gardens are changing our country. We're seeing them everywhere. People are wanting to grow their own food, food and move locally and get into farmers markets, et cetera, and she's a part of that. Um, so Sundance Fest going nationwide for one night only. So um, I'm trying to think what else I need to say about social innovation and art. I guess we'll take a look at this slide since it's up here. Um, so if we think about, we've, you know, I'm a boomer, so I ra was raised in that whole era of industrial right brain model. You know, living in cubes, working in cubes, I've done that. I've, we're now shifting to the left brain, which is more the creative. How do we live more humanly and more in touch with the senses? And that's really more the, the younger generation bringing in the iPod music, a culture that's closer into, you know, the culinary culture. And now, this is someone like my, from my generation, Rainier, um, Chris Rainier. And he works with National Geographic. He w was working with Ansel Adams. So he is a fine art photographer that ended up working with National Geographic. It is Ansel Adams that taught him how to do photography for social meaning. He now has created this thing called All Roads Photography. And it is a, an, an, um, um, a National Geographic sponsored um, bringing cameras into the countries so that people are taking photos of their own experience versus someone like Chris Rainier, who is the great white photographer coming in and showing what they think life is about. So now we're seeing art as social message and innovation. We just skipped past Witness, which is Bono, and um, uh, Peter Gabriel's baby, and how they are now sending out cameras to different uh, traumatic areas of the world so that people can film and um, photograph and post online in real time what's going on so we don't have to rely on the slow-mo um, old media. Now we're seeing what I think is going to really influence art going forward are things like augmented reality, where we have something like colors, and this is, you get the magazine, you RFID it up to your computer, it ends up being, um, having a lot of visual content online as well. So augmented reality, like Google is offering, where you just, the, can the phone is no longer like this, or like this, it's like this, and it tells you all about your world. And they're going to be very creative. Uh, Chimerica is something that Charles um, Eames's grandson has created, and it's a fictional world. And he is beginning to link it up with augmented reality. Um, and we're seeing mirror, mirrored virtuality and real-time tracking. Second Life US Weather, where you can learn about how weather is created. We're also seeing um, Second Life Wimbledon, real-time feed. And we're seeing FBOweb.com, tracking flights in real-time. Google Earth, real-time tracking of earthquakes. And so we'll have more and more art experiences through these tools online. And Twitter lists is something that I'd recommend that we um, really <laughs> align with in the art world so that we make sure that people can know um, what's going on with different artists in an aggregated form. Um, the other thing that I missed was there's a company in Portland that's creating a virtual um, speakers um, for just common everyday tasks. So now we're going to have more and more virtual um, uh, abilities that are going to go with our common everyday tasks, our online banker, etc. And so what will artists be doing with this? And that is my story. Thank you so much. Um, that concludes the Pecha Kucha. And uh, the speakers will be up here. If you have any questions, they'll hang out. And if you have any suggestions or ideas for next year's Pecha Kucha, I'm here. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Appreciate your patience. Thank you. Thank you.